Here comes the sound of my voice, my wonderful voice, talking about Jojen paste, Jojen paste. Ugh. Friends, let's face it, there's an uncomfortable amount of cannibalism in A Song of Ice and Fire. Frankly, I find any amount of cannibalism... Oh, what's the word? It's right on the tip of my tongue, which incidentally is some of the best meat on a human, I'm told. Ah, yes, unpalatable, that's it. Cannibalism is rather unpalatable. But be that as it may, this grisly practice has been with mankind for millennia. Long before Soylent Green, the 1973 American dystopian thriller film notable for serving up green smoothies made of people. What is the secret of Soylent Green? Silent Green is people! Or 1993's Alive, the famous American biographical survival drama film based on Piers Paul Reed's 1974 book, Alive, the story of the Andes survivors, which details a Uruguayan rugby team's crash aboard Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571 into the Andes Mountains in 1972. As you may recall, or perhaps surmise if you haven't seen the film, the survivors of the crash are left with the unfortunate choice between eating the flesh of their dead companions and starving. A dinner party far worse than the Red Wedding. Or was it a Donner Party worse than the Red Wedding dinner? Donner Party. In any case, I don't recall any of these unfortunate plane crash victims turned reluctant cannibals, or Soylent Green drinkers, developing magical green seer power. But the reason Martin is incorporating cannibalism, so much cannibalism, into his story is because at various times and places in human history, there has been an association between eating the flesh of a human and gaining magical power. And often the idea is that you absorb the power or life essence of the person you eat. If, if you eat people, that is. I mean, I don't eat people, but... Rest in peace, Jojen Reed. He was eaten so that a boy might become a wizard. So yes, it's going to be an extra gnarly episode of Mythical Astronomy, and this is absolutely the kind of thing you should pay me for, you sick bastard. So check out our Patreon campaign at lucifermeanslightbringer.com if you have the means. Or you can simply like and share the video to show your appreciation for Jojen Base Theory. Thanks to all of our patrons, and to George R. R. Martin for sharing his macabre culinary fantasies with us. So yes, at various times in our history, some people have eaten other people in the belief that this was a way to gain magical power. We see this dark and twisted notion sprinkled into the idea cauldron of A Song of Ice and Fire, the bitch's brew, if you will, in the infamous A Dance with Dragons prologue, which consists of Vermeer Sixkins recapitulating his life as a naughty skin changer as he lies dying in a hut in the frozen north. Leagues away, in a one-room hut of mud and straw, with a thatched roof and a smoke hole and a floor of hard-packed earth, Faramir shivered and coughed and licked his lips. His eyes were red, his lips cracked, his throat dry and parched. But the taste of blood and fat filled his mouth, even as his swollen belly cried for nourishment. A child's flesh, he thought, remembering Bump. Human meat. Had he sunk so low as to hunger after human meat? He could almost hear Hagon growling at him. Men may eat the flesh of beasts, and beasts the flesh of men. But the man who eats the flesh of man is an abomination. Abomination. That had always been Hagen's favorite word. Abomination, abomination, abomination. To eat of human meat was abomination. To mate as a wolf with wolf was abomination. And to seize the body of another man was the worst abomination of all. Hagen was weak, afraid of his own power. He died weeping and alone when I ripped his second life from him. Vermeer had devoured his heart himself. He taught me much and more, and the last thing I learned from him was the taste of human flesh. Hagon was afraid of his power, but not Vermeer. Vermeer eats the heart. Eat the head! Eat the head! It's not explicitly stated that he's eating Hagon's heart to gain his power, but it certainly has that feel. From a cannibalistic cuisine perspective, the heart isn't the best meat on the human body. I mean, far from it. We all remember Danny trying to eat the heart of the stallion in Vase Dothrak to give power and life to her unborn savior child, and that was not easy. It was also done to gain magic power, which is interesting, even though it was a horse heart and not that of a human. It's definitely a similar concept. And Vermeer, well, he's not just eating a human heart, but the heart of a powerful sorcerer, so that's definitely a bonus meal there. Vermeer also takes the wolf that Hagon would have lived on inside of, which he refers to as ripping his second life from him, and that's another implication of Vermeer stealing Hagon's power when he ate his heart. 
Now, the Vermeer Sixkins prologue, besides being known as one of the best examples of George incorporating short story writing skills into an epic fantasy series, is also widely known as Skin Changer 101. One of the narrative purposes of beginning a dance with dragons with a thorough explanation of second life and skin changer abilities is to give the reader the context to understand Jon Snow's death at the end of the book. By the time Jon dies, the reader should know that he's going to live on in his wolf, Ghost, and that there may be a limited time to get his spirit out of Ghost and back into his soon-to-be-resurrected body. And check out my Green Zombies 1, 2, and 3 videos for more on that. The Vermeer prologue isn't just about Jon, though. As many have noticed, we are given a list of skin-changer abominations that Bran seems to be ticking off like a checklist, as if this list of abominations were some sort of recipe for cooking up a green seer wizard. Oi. Seriously, though, Bran has eaten the flesh of man while in a wolf and while in his own body. And in case you're not in the loop on that one, I'm speaking of the pork which Cold Hands brought back to feed Jojen, Mira, Hodor, and Bran with immediately after killing the Night's Watch mutineers from Craster's Keep. Spoiler alert! That wasn't pork. No more than those three huge pies Wyman Mandalay served up to the phrase at Winterfell contained chunks of seasoned pork swimming in a savory brown gravy. Pretty much any time someone in Westeros is calling something pork during the winter, you should probably not eat that. Anyway, as for Cold Hands' pork, well, it's shown repeatedly that there are no pigs nor game of any kind to be found this far north of the Wall. And there's no question Cold Hands and his ravens did go back and kill those mutineers, who were actually following Bran's company. Cold Hands may well have been leading the mutineers into a trap specifically so he could kill them for food. And check out cantus.wordpress.com for more on that. Bottom line, Bran ate one of the bodies of the dead rangers when he was in summer, his wolf, and then he ate their flesh again while in his own flesh. So that's one abomination under Bran's belt. It's under his belt because the dead people are in his stomach, which is... Okay, you get the picture. Bran regularly seizes the body of another man, Hodor, which is, quote, the worst abomination of all, according to Hagon. As I've said before, George has thankfully spared us any skin-changer wolf-mating scenes with Bran and Summer. Thank you, George. But of course, all of this is leading up to the question of what happened to Jojen after he disappeared from the pages of the narrative in Bran's last chapter, shortly before Bran eats the unsettling weirwood paste. There is no question eating the weirwood paste was done to boost Bran's magical powers, but there definitely is a question of whether or not the Children of the Forest killed Jojen and diced his body up into bite-sized chunks of Cranog Man and then passed it off as a paste of weirwood seeds. We've never seen weirwood seeds, by the way. It is time, Lord Brynden said. Something in his voice sent icy fingers running up Bran's back. Time for what? For the next step. For you to go beyond skin changing and learn what it means to be a green seer. The trees will teach him, said Leaf. She beckoned, and another of the singers padded forward, the white haired one Mira had named Snowy Locks. She had a weirwood bowl in her hands, carved with a dozen faces, like the ones the heart trees wore. Inside was a white paste, thick and heavy, with dark red veins running through it. You must eat of this, said Leaf. She handed Bran a wooden spoon. The boy looked at the bowl uncertainly. What is it? A paste of weirwood seeds. Something about the look of it made Bran feel ill. The red veins were only weirwood sap, he supposed, but in the torchlight they looked remarkably like blood. He dipped the spoon into the paste, then hesitated. Will this make me a green seer? Your blood makes you a green seer, said Lord Brynden. This will help awaken your gifts and wed you to the tree. A paste of weirwood seeds. Yeah, that's it. Weirwood seeds. Drink this. Thank you, Er. What was that thick shake? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's mayonnaise I found in the trash can. Mm. <laughs> and it had hair on it. And you drank it. Mm. Because I'm your doctor. Do what I say. Pay no attention at all to the wooden bowl of bloodthirsty screaming tree faces or the horrific visions of blood sacrifice you're about to see while tripping your little stark nuts off. It's just seed paste. Right, and Soylent Green is totally made of plankton. Spoiler alert for a 50-year-old movie. In the movie Soylent Green, the protagonist eventually figures out that Soylent Green is people because he figures out that the oceans on this dystopian Earth do not have plankton anymore, which is what the Soylent Green is supposedly made of. And like I said, nobody's ever seen or even heard of weirwood seeds outside of this kind of flimsy explanation of the weirwood paste. 
Nobody ever sees them on the ground. Nobody ever talks about planting weirwood seeds. I mean, Garth is said to plant weirwoods, but there's no mention of seeds, so I don't think they exist, folks. One paragraph before the one about Bran eating the weirwood paste, we get a clear death foreshadowing. The moon was a crescent, thin and sharp as the blade of a knife. And this, of course, matches the human sacrifice to the weirwood that Bran sees at the end of this chapter. Then, as he watched, a bearded man forced a captive down onto his knees before the heart tree. A white-haired woman stepped toward them through a drift of dark red leaves, a bronze sickle in her hand. No, said Bran, no, don't. But they could not hear him, no more than his father had. The woman grabbed the captive by the hair, hooked the sickle round his throat, and slashed. And through the mist of centuries, the broken boy could only watch as the man's feet drummed against the earth. But as his life flowed out of him in a red tide, Brandon Stark could taste the blood. Take note that human sacrifice to a weirwood tree by sickle leads to Bran drinking human blood. He cries no and doesn't want the man to die, but ends up drinking the blood anyway through the weirwood tree. Just like he didn't want to wed a tree or eat the paste, but did anyway. Similarly, poor Bran doesn't like eating frogs, but eats them anyway. Eating frogs can be seen as symbolic foreshadowing for Bran eating Jojen as a finely whipped paste because the Cranog men are derisively called frog eaters and are described as being very frog-like themselves. Frog eaters don't smell like men, Frey insisted. They have a boggy stink, like frogs and trees and scummy water. Moss grows under their arms in place of hair, and they can live with nothing to eat but mud and breathe swamp water. They're called frog eaters, and they do eat frogs, but they sound like frogs themselves. I mean, according to the racist phrase, they smell like frogs and swamps, and they live happily in the swamp mud, just like frogs. What's cool is that the very next paragraph gives us insight on why Jojen might be chosen as a sacrifice to awaken Bran's powers. Theon was about to tell him what he ought to do with his wet nurse's fable when Maester Lewin spoke up. The histories say the Cranog men grew close to the children of the forest in the days when the Greenseers tried to bring the hammer of the waters down upon the neck. It may be that they have secret knowledge. The Cranog men do indeed have secret knowledge. Jojen and Mira show up at Winterfell with the words of a pact that have aged for thousands of years and lots of advice for Bran about his developing warg powers. There probably isn't moss under Jojen's armpits, as Walder Frey suggests, but there certainly is in his eyes, and that's far more important. Jojen Reed could scare most anyone. He dressed all in green, his eyes were murky as moss, and he had green dreams. What Jojen dreamed came true. If the idea is that consuming the flesh of one with magical powers increases the amount of magical mana attained by the eater, then Jojen is clearly a nutritious meal. A magical frog, if you will. But instead of turning into a prince, he gets eaten by a prince. That's like almost the same thing. Almost. So if Jojen paste is true, then the weirwood paste can actually be thought of as frog paste or frog soup, which is something Bran eats, although again, reluctantly. Mira will be back soon with supper. I'm sick of frogs. Mira was a frog eater from the neck, so Bran couldn't really blame her for catching so many frogs, he supposed, but even so. Who's hungry, she asked, holding up her catch. Two small silvery trout and six fat green frogs. I am, said Bran, but not for frogs. Back at Winterfell, before all the bad things had happened, the Walders used to say that eating frogs would turn your teeth green and make moss grow under your arms. We'll just have to feed you then. Hmm, that's interesting. So eating frogs, uh, frog paste if you will, makes you greener, and it turns you into a plant. Kind of like how Bran eats weirwood, frog paste, to become a green seer, to begin the process of turning into a tree. I mean, it would be kind of like that if eating frogs and eating weirwood paste were intended to be viewed as parallels. I mean, if, if that were the case, then that line, we'll have to feed you then, coming from Mira and Jojen, implies Jojen as the food that feeds Bran. Uh. Interestingly, both frog soup and weirwood paste turn out to taste a little better than Bran thought they would. It had a bitter taste, though not so bitter as acorn paste. The first spoonful was the hardest to get down. He almost retched it right back up. The second tasted better. The third was almost sweet. The rest he spooned up eagerly. Why had he thought that it was bitter? It tasted of honey, of new-fallen snow, of pepper and cinnamon, and the last kiss his mother ever gave him. 
The empty bowl slipped from his fingers and clattered onto the cavern floor. As you can see, it starts off tasting bad and then turns out tasting great, like the last kiss his mother ever gave him. Now, it's not quite as dramatic with the frog soup, but it does taste better once you eat it. Jojen sent Hodor out for wood and built them a small fire while Bran and Mira were cleaning the fish and frogs. They used Mira's helm for a cooking pot, chopping up the catch into little cubes and tossing in some water and some wild onions Hodor had found to make a froggy stew. It wasn't as good as deer, but it wasn't bad either, Bran decided as he ate. Thank you, Mira, he said. My lady. Wait, wait, wait. What's all this about using a Cranogmen helm to cook frog soup in? Cranogmen heads are supposed to go in Cranogmen helms, not froggy food. Unless Cranogmen heads are froggy food. Where would paste is people? Actually, there's a funny line about eating frogs when Jojen and Mira show up at Winterfell in a Game of Thrones. Rise, I'm Brandon Stark. The girl, Mira, got to her feet and helped her brother up. The boy stared at Bran all the while. We bring you gifts of fish and frog and fowl, he said. I thank you. Bran wondered if he would have to eat a frog to be polite. Well, personally, I don't think it's very polite to eat your friends, Bran, but uh, when in Rome, or at least in a dark green seer cave filled with bones, so many bones, where did they all come from? And on a related note, what exactly is the mystery meat being served to Bran in Blood Raven's cave right before he eats the weird paste? And almost every day they ate blood stew, thickened with barley and onions and chunks of meat. Jojen thought it might be squirrel meat, and Mira said that it was rat. Bran did not care. It was meat, and it was good. The stewing made it tender. You'll forgive me for pointing out that one sentence ends with chunks of meat, and the next word is Jojen. Probably a coincidence. Anyway, just as we know the cold hands didn't serve up pork to Bran and his company because there are no pigs to be found anywhere near there, we can surmise that the chunks of meat floating in the blood stew here probably aren't squirrels or rats, because if there were squirrels or rats anywhere nearby, Summer would have smelled them and eaten them, and we probably would have heard about it. Instead, Summer wanders both the caves and the ground above and finds nothing to eat but white meat. And I don't mean pork, the other white meat. Pork, the other white meat. I mean the other's white meat. Summer dug up a severed arm, black and covered with hoarfrost, its fingers opening and closing as it pulled itself across the frozen snow. There was still enough meat on it to fill his empty belly, and after that was done, he cracked the arm bones for the marrow. Only then did the arm remember it was dead. Bran ate with Summer and his pack as a wolf. All right, so Bran has not only feasted on the dead while in Summer, but also on the undead. So, what was the meat floating in the blood stew that probably wasn't rat or squirrel? Where did the bones come from? I'm just saying, there's really only one readily available source of meat north of the wall, really, and that's the white meat. I suppose you could also include the wildlings, and who knows, maybe Cold Hands picks off a few wildlings every once in a while to stuff in Blood Raven's meat locker or something. And that's where some of the bones and the mystery meat in the stew come from. This blood stew really does stand out as a precursor to the weirwood paste, which has veins of blood, or sap, quote-unquote, running through it. A blood stew with human meat. This is probably what weirwood paste is. Weirwood paste is people! Also, very cool shout-out to the Adams family there, with the severed, whited hand skittering across the snow in a macabre sort of tip-of-the-hat-to thing. As you're beginning to see, the foreshadowing for this horrible realization is spooned out to us in little bits before Bran ever reaches the Cave of Bones and its appealing menu of blood stew with mystery meat and probably Jojen paste. He's eating frog stew, even though it might turn him green, the frog stew is simmering where Cranogmen heads usually go, and he's eating more and more often while using his skin changer magic. Eating while in his wolf, in other words. Eating dead people while skin-changing summer is one of the last foreshadowings for Jojen paste before actual Jojen paste, as we just saw. But even before that, we find clever wordplay and symbolism clues about Bran eating his froggy friend every time Bran eats while in summer. This first tasty morsel is from A Storm of Swords, and had tip to my good friend Ravenous Reader for sniffing it out. This quote is actually something of an appetizer to the one we read earlier about Mira bringing back frogs so Mira and Jojen can feed Bran. You were gone too long. 
Jojen Reed was 13, only four years older than Bran. Jojen wasn't much bigger either, no more than two inches or maybe three, but he had a solemn way of talking that made him seem older and wiser than he really was. At Winterfell, Old Nan had dubbed him Little Grandfather. Bran frowned at him. I wanted to eat. Jojen Reed wasn't much bigger, no more than two inches or maybe three. He's just a teeny tiny bite-sized frog, you guys. Bran looks at him and says, I wanted to eat. Patience, Bran, patience. You have to reach the Weirwood Cave first. You need the secret elven recipe for frog paste. Anyway, you can see that Bran wanted to keep using magic, and he wanted to keep eating. And indeed, he does have to eat the Weirwood Paste to use his most powerful magic. And again, after Bran looks at Jojen and says, I wanted to eat, Mira says, we'll have to feed you, and then feeds him frogs. All right, here's a similar wordplay based Jojen eating clue that I found in A Clash of Kings. And again, it comes as Bran is awakened from his wolf dream by Jojen. As you listen, remember that Bran is a Stark, and therefore a symbolic wolf. Jojen especially sees him that way, having named him the Winged Wolf upon their meeting. I ate, said Bran. We ran down an elk and had to drive off a tree cat that tried to steal him. The cat had been tan and brown, only half the size of the dire wolves, but fierce. He remembered the musky smell of him and the way he had snarled down at them from the limb of the oak. The wolf ate, Jojen said, not you. Take care, Bran. Remember who you are. The wolf ate, Jojen said. The wolf ate, Jojen said. Oh, the wolf ate, Jojen. I see. And this in response to Bran boldly asserting that he ate, Jojen. The wolf ate, Jojen said. Okay, all right. Bran's wolf, Summer, did almost actually kind of eat Jojen on the night they all met. And speaking of foreshadowing, it even happened in front of a weirwood tree. Do you fall every night, Bran? Jojen asked quietly. A low, rumbling growl rose from Summer's throat, and there was no play in it. He stalked forward, all teeth and hot eyes. Mira stepped between the wolf and her brother, spear in hand. Keep him back, Bran. Jojen is making him angry. Mira shook out her net. It's your anger, Bran, her brother said. Your fear. It isn't. I'm not a wolf. Yet he'd howled with them in the night and tasted blood in his wolf dreams. Jojen is asking Bran about his dreams, which makes he and Summer angry. As you can see here, Bran is a wolf, and the taste of blood is tantamount to that warg experience. So then here, as his wolf alter ego threatens to eat Jojen, we get this line. Summer, Bran shouted. To me, Summer. He slapped an open palm down on the meat of his thigh. Ugh, the meat of his thigh? George really wants us to think about cannibalism here while Bran's wolf thinks about eating Jojen, I guess. Summer doesn't actually eat Jojen, of course. This isn't the day he dies, as he always says. But one certainly could see this as foreshadowing of Bran eating Jojen, which it's kind of looking like he did. Take a look at this gnarly passage, which definitely sounds like foreshadowing. Bran, call them off. I can't. Jojen, up the tree. There's no need. Today is not the day I die. Do it, she screamed, and her brother scrambled up the trunk of the weirwood, using the face for his handholds. The dire wolves closed. Hmm, so you're saying Jojen scrambled up a weirwood. Are you sure you didn't mean Jojen scrambled up in a weirwood bowl? Yeah, that's right. Jojen scrambled up the tree. Yeah. Jojen uses the weirwood face for handholds, but the weirwood face bowl holds Jojen's hands and face, perhaps. Even the raw symbolism here foreshadows Jojen paste. Bran's wolf wants to eat Jojen, then Jojen goes up the weirwood tree, as if acting out the idea of him merging with the weirwood paste for Bran to eat. Scrambled up the tree, oh George. Look folks, we just have to face the facts. Jojen paste is what was in the weirwood bowl. After all, we've already seen that Jojen's come in wooden bowls. The three-eyed crow, thought Bran, the green seer. It's not so far, he said. A little climb, and we'll be safe. Maybe we can have a fire. All of them were cold and wet and hungry, except the ranger, and Jojen Reed was too weak to walk unaided. You go. Mira Reed bent down beside her brother. He was settled in the bowl of an oak, eyes closed, shivering violently. What little of his face could be seen beneath his hood and scarf was as colorless as the surrounding snow, but breath still puffed faintly from his nostrils whenever he exhaled. Mira had been carrying him all day. Food and fire will set him right again, Bran tried to tell himself, though he wasn't sure it would.
Shivering, he settled into the bowl of an oak. Settled like a glob of gently quivering gelatinous paste settling into a wooden bowl. First he's scrambled up in a tree, now he's settling into a wooden bowl. Don't blame me, I don't make the rules, and I'm not sure food will set Jojen right either. Certainly not if he's the food. Although if he is the food, he could then be set, like set on the table. Ah oh yes, set the Jojen paste on the right over there. And of course, the word bowl can be used to describe the trunk of a tree or sometimes the little knobby extrusions from the trunk that contain the seeds. Yes, the wooden bowl contains the seeds. And also Jojen, settling into the bowl. Mm. Now, because Jojen's colorless, snow-white face is the only thing poking out from his hood, his pasty face really would resemble the white paste in the round bowl. At the same time, Jojen's snow-white face also mimics the carved faces on the white weirwooden bowl containing the paste. In fact, elsewhere in A Dance with Dragons, George describes a weirwood tree with the words, its bowl and branches white as the surrounding snows. A snow-white weirwooden bowl and a snow-white Jojen face settling into the bowl. All right, who's hungry? Finally, when Bran eats the paste, one of the things the taste is compared to is snow like the color of Jojen's pasty white face. Folks, if it looks like Jojen's face, and it tastes like Jojen's face, well... Bran ate Jojen's face, okay? That's what I'm saying. Where would paste is people? Oh, hello, didn't see you there. Thanks so much for watching the video, guys. Thanks for letting me gross you out with the Jojen paste theory. You know, if you want the Sword of the Morning, if you want Nissa Nissa and Queen Daenerys and all that fun stuff, you gotta eat your Georgie Nice too. In any case, guys, I hope you enjoyed this. Hope it didn't gross you out too much. Congratulations for finishing it. This was a real labor of love, you know. It wasn't snow cut and paste affair, folks. Anyways, I'll see you again with something a little bit less disgusting. And be sure to like the video, check out the Patreon. Yada, yada, yada. I make disgusting videos.